everybody. Uh, well, welcome to the final uh, session of the spring 2021 CEDAR uh, risk seminar. I'm Lisa Goldberg, as you know, I'm moderating the seminar. I'm so happy to see all of you. And today uh, I am delighted to introduce my all old friend. Uh, as, I don't know how long we've known each other, Rick, but it's been a while. Uh, Rick Bookstaber, who's done all sorts of things, uh, written famous books, testified in front of Congress about safety and danger in financial markets. And today uh, he'll be talking to us about intelligent, uh, using history for building forward-looking scenarios. So Rick, over to you. Great, thanks. Um, just so I know, how long should I be speaking for? Uh, great question. So we uh, run the seminar for an hour and 20 minutes, but you're under no obligation to fill up that time. And of course, the, however long you want to talk, okay. please do yeah. leave question, time for questions at the end. I'm sure there'll okay. be many. Yeah, I want to make sure I don't overdo it. Um, so let me share my screen and then uh, I can share my... Uh, um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about modeling scenarios. Um, and I, I'm going to be doing it in a little bit different way than, and with a little different objective than I think people typically do. Uh, but first, I want to recognize uh, research assistance I got from Vincent Michael, who recently graduated from the Master of Financial Engineering program at Haas. Uh, he worked with me on this as one of his projects. And what I'm going to be going through is uh, to a large extent based on the analysis that he did. Um, so first, let me describe what I think of as a scenario. Uh, and this is one. And, uh, you know, it's usually when people talk about scenarios, what they do is they talk about, oh, if this occurs, stocks will drop 20% and fixed income uh, will rise by 100 basis points. To me, the, I, I make a distinction. I, I look at, there's sort of a few principles that I, I look at with risk management that guide my view of scenarios. One is that the future doesn't look like the past. And that's the reason you have a scenario, uh, because you have to envision some future uh, rather than just looking at historical data. Uh, the second is that risk is a narrative. <clears throat> it's not a number. Uh, what I mean by narrative is when I uh, worked, I've worked as chief risk officer at a lot of different firms. Uh, Morgan Stanley and Solomon on the sell side, uh, more capital, Bridgewater on the buy side. Um, and when there's any sort of risk issue, what people do is they basically sit around a table and talk. And they're constructing a story, they're constructing a narrative of how the events will unfold, how things might cascade, how things might propagate. And so to me, that's the nature of risk. It's not saying VAR is 12.3% or whatever. I mean, that's important to know, but if you stop there, you're really missing the richness of what's involved with risk. So when I'm looking at a scenario, what I'm thinking are, can basically be boiled down to three points or four points. One is, uh, What's the minimum? How far down do you think things will go? How long will it take to get there? How, what's the speed with which you can expect recovery to occur? And with what sort of volatility will the price path take place? And as you can see, it, there's not a defined answer. It's not like it'll go down for this long, it'll take this long to recover. There's a cloud around it. This is generated through many possible worlds that are generated based on the assumption of what's triggering the scenario. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the modeling issues behind it. Uh, uh, it's more the conceptual, but I think you have to think of scenarios in this way and where you end up in this envelope, whether you choose to think it's gonna be bad or medium or really not so bad, depends on the nature of the environment now. So in any scenario, you have to look at it 
as a response curve, as a set of possible paths, and where you think it will be across those sets of paths depends on the nature of the vulnerability of the market right now. If this scenario occurs now, how bad will it be given the leverage in the market, the concentration, the liquidity of the market, credit conditions, and so on? So that's the whole nature of how to look at scenarios. And, uh, and so there's a start, a minimum, a recovery, there's volatility. Um, now, what I'm going to be doing is talk about a way of looking at and developing scenarios, but when I'm as much interested in conveying as this as methodology is the general conceptual approach that I'm going to use because it's one that I think is not applied very much in sort of the academic, well, in the world of people being prepared for industry as they're looking at risk. And it's one that I wasn't prepared for either because my background was very much quantitative. Uh, but things changed a little bit for me when I worked at Bridgewater Associates right before the financial crisis. Um, Bridgewater, uh, which is run by Ray Dalio, as I think most of you know, has a what at the time I thought was a sort of anti-scientific approach to looking at uh, risk and looking at how to measure things because they would basically go back and investigate historical events. Uh, during the 2008 crisis, we went all the way back to even look at the Weimar Republic to try to get a sense of what might go on now. And in fact, when I first did a, a seminar presentation to uh, for Ray and others when I was first joining there, <clears throat> and I was talking about value at risk and how you look at value at risk, Ray said, um, so do you just go back to the post-war period or do you go back further? And I was like, I, I don't get it. What do, you, what do you mean? Because, you know, two years back, that seems pretty reasonable. Uh, but his perception is that what's, what's going on in the market now in certain respects can be observed in previous events. In certain respects, it's different. And it's, it's kind of funny because it's different relative to the past few years. The past few years of volatility in the market are not necessarily a good guide to risk going forward. But past events going back 10, 20, 30, 40 years can be informative. So what I'm going to do is kind of show how I have applied that methodology to gain some background information to inform decisions on how to do scenarios. And the starting point for doing it, which I won't uh, show you a graph because you all know how it would go, is I literally went to Yahoo Finance and I, um, sorry, I, I literally went to Yahoo Finance and uh, just took the S&P history and just looked over time for periods where there were notable variations in price. And without knowing, although I did know, but without kind of biasing things based on what happened then, I would just say, ah, here's a, you know, an event that occurred. And I would take that event and, um, Sorry, the slideshow, uh, no, back to slideshow, okay. And I would uh, take a list of all these times that the market dropped a reasonable amount over a reasonable time. So right there, it's non-quantitative. It's somewhat uh, subjective. And once I had these cases where I said, okay, there seems to be a move down in the market starting on April 3rd, 1970, and it seems like it, re it reached, it's not seems like, but it reached its minimum around July 12th, 1970 and tended to get back around October, 1970. That would be a snippet that would be defined as an event. Uh, then once I had all of these, I went back and asked what was the driver that led to that event? Uh, and of course that's either based on my background knowledge or going through Google to find it out. 
And so now I had 50 some odd events, which I categorized based on what the, it was that generated those events into four types, fundamental, macro, non-economic or extra-economic and market-driven. And of course, many of the fundamental macro-driven events are also tied to a macro event. So there's some judgment there also. So I'm kind of emphasizing here that there's judgment that's not wholly quantitative, that's based on a review of history. And so now I could categorize things into these four types. And then the thing to ask is, is this an intelligent way of categorization? Uh, to me, it's intelligent, you know, because just based on experience and, you know, common sense, it seems reasonable. Um, but then you want to ask, is there a real difference between these? And where you finally go with this is, <clears throat> if there is a big difference between these, and there's characteristics that are fairly uniform for historical events of each type, then if we're looking at a forward scenario of a macro type, we can go back and look at what other ones were like. Were there characteristics that they had in common in terms of how long it took for them to drop, in terms of how much the drop was, and so on. Now, another thing that I did, again, somewhat qualitative, is uh, for each event, I tried to understand something about the market environment when that event occurred, because you don't look at a scenario in isolation. You don't look at it out of context. You want to know, I'm sitting here today and I'm looking at this possibility of what might occur. Well, what is the nature today that might matter for how that event will propagate over time? Am I in a recession? Obviously, that'll make a, a difference. Uh, is there rate risk? Is there inflation risk or expectations of inflation? Or I'm in the period of extreme optimism in the market. Am I in a position, I know nobody wants to use the term bubble, but is there something like an earnings bubble? Um, is there concentration in the market? And all these things can be pegged to some sort of data. Concentration would be based on the percent of the S&P market cap represented by that subset of stocks. Earnings bubble can be defined as earnings above some threshold price earnings or price to sales ratio. Uh, optimism can be measured based on any number of optimism or sentiment measures and so on. Uh, so, so now just to give you a sense, here's two what I call response curves. Uh, the first one, and I apologize when I reproduce these to put in the slide, they're not super high resolution, but I think you, you know, can sort of see the, the basic point. So here's a response curve where it started uh, around 19, just before, around 1969, the market dropped, it reached its minimum uh, in 1970, and then took time to recover. This would be an example of an event where I would have found it first just visually. And then I said, what in the world was this thing? And it turned out it was a recession in 1969. And you can see some of that sort of characteristic here. It goes down and it goes back up in a fairly symmetric way. It takes a couple of years to do it. By contrast, here's a uh, the, the, the basic uh, trade war sort of between uh, China and the US. Here it drops very precipitously and then has relatively slower time going up. So one of the first differentiating characteristics that I found for different scenarios was some of them, this is not surprising, but some of them go down slowly and come up slowly and tend to be symmetric. Some have a very sudden drop and then take a relatively longer time to recover versus that drop. And it turns out that the one case, the top case is typical of some types and the bottom case is typical of other types. So we already find that the types differentiate different sorts of scenarios. Uh, now, you know, this here, this was one response curve. 
just to give you a sense, here's a set of response curves for three recessions and one credit tightening event. And you can see in each case, sort of gradual down over typically a half a year uh, or so, slowly going back up where you say recovery is somewhat subjective, but you know it sort of recovers about the same amount of time as going down. Uh, so this is the sort of response curve that you would expect from, uh, so imagine that you could see the world for a period of 10,000 years, you might have a hundred, well, uh, 10,000 years, you might have like 500 of these or a thousand of these events, uh, then you would trace this out from it. So that's kind of the way to think of this, that we are seeing a few cases of uh, what would trace out a response curve more broadly. By contrast, this is the market-driven. And again, market-driven, just to go back up for a second, is it's price rather than fundamentally value-based. So things like leverage, momentum, concentration, most crises scenarios are of this type, like LTCM in 1998 uh, would be market-driven. And here you can see this is really distinct. Here, and there'll be more analysis of this that shows this, uh, but essentially you go down very quickly. It can take a while to recover. And the uh, going down, it's sort of at the same rate, but it's just a question of how far down you go. And then the recovery is proportional to the, to the time it takes to get down there. So there's a relationship between the amount of the drop and the time to get to the drop and the amount of the drop and the time to get back. So this is uh, you know, different in type from the macro. Rick, Rick can I ask a question? Yeah. With the exception of the Asia stock market bubble, it looks to me like most of your examples were in the US. Have I got that right yeah. or missed oh, yeah. something? That's right. Actually, it's all US. That's a good point. I should have mentioned at the beginning. All of this is US. And in and, each case, I'm looking at the S&P. And, and, and what's the reason for that restriction? Uh, why, why is that help your analysis? You, you don't have to be restricted that way. Uh, so you could. So this is the Asia stock market bubble as it affected US stocks. OK. So but, even that's US. Yeah. So that's all these things are some event occurred it might be an event that occurred outside the US, like Brexit is another one that we did. Um, but how does it affect US stocks? Um, the reason I did this this way is, um, you know, it, it's easier and the bulk of risk that people take is US, but somebody could easily do the same exercise for any other country. Uh, would you expect your your high level uh, categories to work in a more broad context? Like, what about the Japan recession? Yeah, I would I would think that the same characteristics would be true for any major liquid market, but that's just my sense. But but keep in mind, this thing isn't perfect. Um, so, like when I look at the macro, I didn't look at a couple of, I looked at it, but then threw out as outliers, a couple of cases because they were um, like the, the stagflation in 1970, you know, was very, very long. And of course it's something to keep into account, but I was trying to get a kind of a general representation. So something like what happened in Japan, the lost generation, uh, would be like a monster outlier to just about any study. Well, some of these look like shocks and recoveries, and the macro response curves look more complex. Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's right. These, the market-driven, are much more like shock and recovery because think what's going on in market-driven. It's It's basically leverage, illiquidity, so a, a liquidity cycle event. Uh, people are highly leveraged. They have to sell. They're selling impairs liquidity. 
you get a cascade would be something that'd be market driven periods of high concentration where people have to get out of the market uh, and there's a lot there's a lot of people trying to get out that door um, would be examples uh, and so they tend to have you know more of this characteristic where things tend to go down quickly finally it's exhausted you know all the people who had to get out are getting out um, and uh, in fact, if you look at periods of high concentration, uh, the oil shock, the dot-com bubble, the banking problems in 08, they all kind of have this characteristic. Whereas the others look a little bit like an um, AR1 with mean reversion. Yeah, I mean, these could be, uh, yeah, there is, all of these have a mean reversion uh, because there, because it, it'll be mean reverting for no other reason than stocks on, on average tend to go up. So, you know, finally, uh, so long as there's a long-term 7% return to stocks, finally, for whatever reason, you're gonna get back up near where you started. Um, so I'd like to explore that a little bit. So you, you said that uh, the Nikkei um, collapsed in 1990 and then the very slow recovery. It's still not back up to its historic high. This is an outlier. And indeed, it's, it's certainly a rare event. No question, you don't find lots of those uh, lying around. But uh, if you look at this from the standpoint of a defined benefit pension plan, um, you got to be concerned that maybe the S&P 500 will have a lost decade or a lost three decades because that would dramatically impair your ability to pay your, uh, make, to meet your obligations. Um, um, and, and, and so I, I find it, 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 it a bit worrisome. I mean, obviously uh, that doesn't tell you much about the uh, 2008 crash, which happened for quite different reasons and from which the recovery was slow, but uh, not nearly as slow as Japan. But but somehow, if you're an asset manager with a long time horizon, don't you have to worry about things like that? Yeah, yeah. So this is not, this is one tool for kind of uh, the sort of scenarios that you might structure that are like the scenarios that this is built on. So like, what are the scenarios I'm concerned about right now? A tech bubble type of market-driven scenario uh, uh, ex inflation expectations scenario, um, you know, but there is sort of the major secular issue that would have to be looked at separately and now actually would be a very, very much a qualitative exercise uh, as opposed to, because it would be unlike what's happened before, unless you wanted to do the Ray Dalio approach. He has a whole book that actually was although it just came out recently, was actually uh, done uh, while I was there in 2008, where it was looking at, you know, Weimar Republic, as I mentioned, and all these others. But uh, that longer term, this is not going to be helpful for the, the sort of events where it's a lost decade or a lost generation. <coughs> okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, so looking at these, what you can do is, I call this sentiment, it's actually fundamental, I changed the name. So you have fundamental, macro, non-economic, and market-driven, and the thing that's interesting is I looked at things that are Symmetric up versus down. So I won't go back to the chart, but you know, does it go down and go up at more or less the same? And and I we actually defined what we meant by the same, uh, or is it, uh, you know, what's the percent symmetric up versus down? Macro, most of them were non-economic. Only one was. So these are the ones that are most significant. Non-economic, 
it shoots down very quickly with a geopolitical event and goes up more slowly. Macro, this what, what you're observing with these cases is pretty much true across the board, although it is a limited sample. And then is it steeper on the way down than back up? Non-economic, for sure. Macro, no, it tends to be symmetric. And with fundamental market driven, you can kind of uh, take your um, pick. Uh, the sample size is too small, I think, to really say one or the other. But we are seeing some differences. These are ad hoc categories. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we had a definition which I can't remember now. It was symmetric if basically the minimum was between three fifths, two fifths, and uh, three fifths of the midpoint. Uh, so we actually did use some metric for what we meant by steeper than or symmetric, but I can't remember what it is. Um, now, I won't go through this. Uh, well, let me sort of show you just, I, I, I list here the fundamental events, the market-driven events, and so on. But, it, but just because I think it's interesting to see how this is a, a very by-hand exercise, Oops, let's see. Oh, I see what's going on here. I think I have to do that. Um, here is uh, the actual spreadsheet. This is, so this is not rocket science. Uh, I, for each of the events, I had the start minimum end date. Uh, then I could categorize it based on was it uh, a catalyst that was sentiment slash fundamental macro, non-economic, leverage liquidity. Then I looked and said, was that during a recession, a tight money period? Was it during a rate rise? Um, uh, and so on. Was it an earnings bubble? Uh, then I have a vulnerability model. So I could say, was it in a period of vulnerability or not, which is based on concentration, leverage, liquidity, credit cycle. Uh, was it a period of high concentration? Uh, so all of these things, and then uh, all, and then this is basically uh, how fast did it go down versus up, you know, in terms of shape. But then uh, uh, and then the name of each, sort of an explanation of each one. So this is the data set. Uh, it's not a huge data set, but it's informative. I, I'm not trying to, here's the other thing too, I'm trying to glean information as best I can from history. I, I'm, so I'm not trying to sort of test or prove a hypothesis. I'm trying to just say, rather than just winging it and saying, oh, uh, one of my scenarios is that such and such a non-economic event will occur, gee, what do I think might happen? I can garner some information so I'm not totally shooting in the dark. And that I think is a, a philosophy for, so there's a couple of philosophical things that are in this, which are not appealing if somebody's you know purely in a, a hypothesis setting empirical mode. One is the thing is done by hand. This, the second is it's looking at events historically that obviously are all qualitative. The third is I'm not testing a hypothesis. I'm trying to just garner a sense that can give me more information when I do a scenario going forward. But the other part of this that's really valuable and I think uh, for any student, it's useful is, you know, th there's this whole post-war period. I, I look at everything from 1946 on. So there's this post-war period and like Vincent, by the time this thing was done, has this set of case studies in his brain 
and what's happened in the past, how bad things could go. So if he's looking at something looking forward, he can say, yeah, you know, uh, back in 80 or 81, this sort of thing happened, or gee, this is a lot like what happened in 94. So that's why I, I'm saying that I think this is really valuable also just as a exercise to gain history. Um, so, so here I, I just list the various events and we don't have to go through them, but, but these are all based on uh, what's in that spreadsheet. You can see from macro, all those fuzzy, you know, recession, recession, tight money, tight money, uh, banking and the stability, uh, Fed rate rise in 2018 and so on. Uh, Non-economic events. I even went back to North Korea invades the South, Bay of Pigs, Cuban Missing Crisis, Kennedy assassinated, 9-11, Brexit vote, uh, COVID. And what's interesting is, as I went through these, virtually every decade was represented, uh, not so much for economic events, but if you go through macro events or fundamental events, uh, market-driven events, you know, it's pretty broadly representative across the decades of 1950 through, because it also has 1946, but half of the 40s all the way through to 2020 with uh, COVID. Now, what I did um, also is uh, because of what we saw way up here, it, it was clear that at least in some cases, there's a relationship between the amount things drop and the time it takes to drop, or the amount things drop and the time it takes to recover. So we did a scatter plot to just get a sense of that and also to get a sense of, uh, you know, is there a general cluster of how long it takes for these events to occur? Is there a general cluster for how big the drops tend to be? So here we've got fundamental events, we put them in a scatter plot. And uh, you can see it's pretty much all over the place. So here, you can't really, uh, you know, there's not a lot of information there to link the size of the drop to the, the days to the drop. Uh, but in terms of days to recover, if we ignore this one outlier, there actually is somewhat of a relationship between the size of the drop and the days to recover. With macro events, again, maybe you could, you know, the T statistic is like four or something, but you don't have a big sample. But the thing, but here you kind of see a cluster that basically macro events tend to cluster in this area. And then you have ridiculous outliers, like this is one I mentioned from 1970. Uh, but if I were going to do a scenario for macro, rather than just sort of winging it, I would sort of feel like the response curve should more or less cover these types of events. Uh, it's not full, you know, huge information, but it's better than sitting there and, you know, throwing darts in the dark. Uh, macro events, days to recover versus drop, is, you know, there's a reasonable relationship there Again, this outlier and this outlier help the slope move along, but you do have this cluster. Non-economic, as, as we saw from the chart, very strong relationship between the days to, to get to the drop and the percent of the drop. So now if I'm drawing a scenario and I'm hypothesizing a non-economic event and its severity, I can get a reasonable read on how long I think it'll take to get there. So, so now I kind of get to where this, where these things finally lead us uh, in terms of how we can use it for building scenarios. And I use two examples. Uh, I use uh, recession events from macro and bubble events 
from fundamental, sorry, from market driven. So out of the events we had, we have kind of not so kind of lower bound of, so what I did is looked at the clusters, ignoring any outliers, because I'm just trying to get a general sense of what's going on. And he said, okay, for these clusters, here's on the low side, it drops about 15%, takes about 25 days, uh, you know, ends uh, after 55 days. Uh, the mean sort of mode is uh, typical drop 20 days uh, and it gets to the minimum drop in about 37 business days and so on. And here's the upside. And if you plot each of these, you have it going down this far and up, down this far and up, and for the upper drop, this far and up. And so now you sort of have a real schematic version of a response curve. So if I'm if I have no model, uh, and somebody puts a gun to my head and says, "Draw me the best you can of an envelope for how you think a response would be for a bubble event," rather than making it up, I can use this. And then if I add to it, saying, "Oh, and by the way, we have excessive optimism, concentration is huge, and so on," then I say, "If I'm going to pick from this envelope," I'll pick something a little more on the downside because we're in a very vulnerable situation. Um, and what's and so you can add sort of narrative in. It's not like something comes out of the computer and you have to go with it. You can kind of have a discussion, uh, but within a context of history. Uh, whereas here's uh, for macro, and here if you look at the time it takes to drop. 75, 140, 200 versus 25, 37, 48. Uh, so, you know, it's a long way getting down. And uh, the amount of the drop, uh, so now you have a response curve here where again, you know, the, the length of time on the bottom is different. And that's a starting point for absent having a model or anything else it's a starting point for setting the response curve for the scenario. So, um, so this is you know the methodology that I used, and th the end result of it is um, in this last slide. Uh, what I did is I said, okay, we have. Uh, Given the the scenarios, given you know the the range that I showed before of you know where things could be, then I, I said, okay, well let's look at actual scenarios that I'm concerned about. And rather than just saying, oh, uh, I think uh, risk is there's risk of inflation and overheated economy. And um, I'll tell you why I put MSCI there in a second. I can sort of say, okay, rather than just saying, oh, if that happens, I think uh, equities will drop 15% and I'm done. I can say, well, on a low, medium, high basis, I think it could be 75 days to get to the bottom. The volatility on the way down will be 1.25 times what it is now. Uh, it will be down around 10%. It'll take about 50 days to return. And although I didn't do it in this presentation, along with the analysis for equities, I also did analysis for treasuries and for high yield spreads. So, so the response curve that we have, is not just equity based. There's a similar response curve for, for credit spreads and for treasuries. And so what it's, you know, so, treasuries, uh, high yield spreads, and so on. And so then I can use these absent using a model or other things as a starting point for drawing the response curves. And then I can look at the present 
situation in the market in terms of its vulnerability and decide where within this response curve envelope, I think things will likely be. Um, now, the reason I, I put MSCI here, and I should have for a few others as well. Oh, sorry, let me just get this out of here. Um, sorry. Uh, so another thing we do for scenarios is we try to use other people's expert opinion. And so I'll look at what the Federal Reserve is looking at, what BIS is looking at. So the, so the major think tanks uh, you know, of the economy. We also look at what BlackRock's thinking, what MSCI is thinking, and use that to sort of give us a starting point uh, before we do the analysis. So, so basically, uh, this is kind of the end of the presentation. We can go into questions. The, the approach that I take is, I guess it would not work as an academic approach, but it's close to the approach that matters. That, that's the, the sort of dynamics that occur in an industry setting where people are sitting around the table who have a lot of experience, who've lived through a lot of these things. Uh, I've lived through everything from 1972 on. Um, you know, nobody around probably has lived through uh, the Korean War, but you know, so, so without realizing it, we're bringing our experiences up. Uh, we're using judgment about the nature of the market as it stands now. And we're relying on other people's expert opinion and the experience they have and the data they're looking at. So this is kind of trying to codify that to some extent, where instead of kind of trying to remember it, I actually go back and look at it. Instead of sort of cherry picking in an arbitrary way, I try to cherry pick by looking at four different types and throwing out things where when I think about that doesn't really quite apply. Uh, combine current information on leverage liquidity concentration to root it into the current environment and use other people's expert views to help inform the sense of what I'm doing. So that plus, uh, you know, the key point of how I look at scenarios, uh, uh, you know, as not just a number, but as a uh, response group is kind of the basis of what we do. And then we, we can add to that actual modeling uh, using an agent-based model, but, but not relying just on the model. The model is one part of the framework to use. So that's, uh, that's it for presentation. So you know, I'm open to questions. Do you have any questions from the audience? Um, I have a question. Um, practically, what um, models or methods do you use to generate the, um, the scenarios? Uh, is it uh, like some kind of Markov chains uh, or I don't know, backward uh, generation? Or would you actually do it because uh, so my, my question is uh, usually like if you, you want to put a, a process with uh, with a drift or a volatility, then the drift is usually difficult to actually estimate from from the data. Yeah. So um, so we use what we call a factor simulation model. Uh, what we do is we have a relationship with MSCI. Uh, a partnership and we get all of their factor information. We use their factors as the basis of what we do. So we go from asset space to factor space, generate the paths within the factor space, and then reconstruct any portfolio or set of assets on that basis. 
uh, the factor simulation model is a Bayesian type of a model where we can uh, use the sort of information I just mentioned uh, as part of a prior uh, to generate it. And um, so, so within here are Bayesian informed paths based on factors that are then reconstructed or used to reconstitute the actual assets underlying, in this case, the Vanguard global equity portfolio, but it could be you know, any portfolio. So you give me your portfolio, I can decompose it to factors. I can generate the implications for each factor of the scenario and then back it uh, back up to, to get the portfolio. Thank you. So I'll, I'll ask a question about that factor-based approach uh, since um, just something that came up in the most recent uh, disruption, which was last March in COVID, there was a strange thing that happened uh, with betas, a migration. So traditionally, beta is kind of a factor in MSCI, I guess, and also a factor in a lot of equity investing. And a lot of traditionally low beta sectors their betas shot up and uh, some of the higher beta sectors, their betas, uh, IT, kind of all of these big tech companies, I guess, just as they became more and more of the market, perhaps as part of the explanation, their betas came down. And I'm wondering how, how this all, all handles those kinds of disruptions if you're using factors and the factors aren't, the factor exposures aren't really stationary through these periods of disruption. Yeah, so that's uh, actually March of last year was a, a great example to use for this uh, more ad hoc historical approach on one hand and the agent based approach on the other. Um, because you got, you ended up with something that was disassociated from history. You know, you went from a market that was just on the verge of destruction. Uh, one of the days, only $250 million of treasuries traded, which is basically like the market disappeared. And if the world's most liquid market essentially is disappearing, you know you're in big trouble. Um, so you went from a period of low liquidity to suddenly having infinite liquidity. And so any sort of approach that relies on, hist that relies on an empirical assumption of stability you know, it's just not going to work. Um, so th at that point, you have to either rely on intuition uh, or you use a model. Like the great thing about an agent-based model is you can instantaneously reassert a change in uh, liquidity by simply changing the parameter govern governing the heuristic of market makers. And so a market that looks bad, you turn that switch and now it's not so bad anymore. Um, if you look at history, uh, for example, if there were a tech bubble uh, now, and that's one of the scenarios, and that is a scenario that we're looking at, um, we can look at what are, what are some other tech bubbles? Well, you know, the big one was dot .com. Um, and then there's another tech bubble in the late 19. 60s with the nifty 50 and so on uh, you know during these bubbles you get uh, the the actual market that's the catalyst can drop 70 percent and the market itself maybe drops 30 to 45 percent uh, in fact if you look at uh, a, here we have the tech bubble if you look at the tech bubble you can see that we have tech broken out as a specific second, second area because it's gonna behave notably differently. So it, it's, so the answer, you know, there's no one answer uh, to it, but it's sort of a, a Bayesian, ideally what you want to do is have a multi-dimensional approach where it's Bayesian, where if, and we're not doing this now, but I could tell you, you know, the way I would solve that problem and we'll get there later is 
if you know the times that factors tend to break, you rely less on those factors and the, the relationships they've had and rely more on the characteristics that seem to be implicit in the event that you're currently in, or you rely on models that are not using the past as a basis for uh, you know, their information. Um, but yeah, the, the key reason, you know, scenarios typically, I think the past, almost the main reason you use scenarios is the past is no longer a guide. And so I would bet that in almost any scenario, you're going to get more noise and factors than you would in a, a normal period. I would think, although I haven't made a systematic study of that, but I, I do have in mind that the factors are less constant during disruptive periods. I mean, you know, one thing that'd be interesting to do is what I just did with the S&P for all these cases you could do with factors. And it may turn out that certain factors have a characteristic behavior, but not a stable behavior, but a characteristic unstable behavior for certain types of events. It, it could be. Uh. I mean, you know, the, the, the S&P is, when you really break it down, the S&P is largely just a few factors. So, you know, what you see for the S&P probably would have to carry through to some extent to the two or three factors that make up the bulk of its exposure. More questions from the audience. Yes, hi Rick. Um, I, I just happened to notice that on your market event graph, there are obviously not enough points, but it seems to me that the time to recovery seems to be dependent on the time of history. So would you, have you considered like the acceleration or basically a speed factor for going forward? And my, uh, yeah. Yeah, so here, let me go to that one. Yes. This one? Yeah. So if, if we look at the, the, the chronological dates of these four curves, it seems like the recovery is accelerating with time. Yeah, so, well, it's also accelerating, you know, with the amount of the drop, right? Right, but uh, the, the, this could be dependent because the markets are less liquid in the past, so it yeah. takes a longer time to get out. And yeah. obviously that's- So what, what you're saying, yeah, what you're saying is absolutely right, uh, based on the observations I've had, that the speed, so here it's a little confusing because it's also true that the less the drop, the smaller the drop, the faster it recovers. But it, it is true that things are recovering faster, everything else equal, the closer you get to the present, especially if you do say pre-1995 to post-1995 or around 90, 1990 and for the reasons that I think intuitively you're mentioning or thinking about, that uh, the markets are more liquid, people can act more quickly, the whole decision process is greater. Uh, so there is that sort of secular characteristic. Yeah, and, and, and the second thought is that also like we're looking at the absolute value of the market. That's my understanding, right? That's not a relative one. And so have you thought about comparing this with the money supply or kind of the fiscal inflation? Um, well, one thing we did, which isn't quite that, but um, you know, we do look at these characteristics, uh, but we don't, so rate risk or, uh, you know, you could say, well, wait a minute, is our rates really low? Uh, and there's, you know, threat of the Fed or rates intermediate, and there's a threat from the Fed. Uh, we're not looking at that, but actually another point that maybe is related to what you're saying is the institutions that matter for recession and rate risk and inflation uh, have changed. The Fed now is different from what it was pre-2008 
and that's different from what it was pre-Volcker and so on. So there's a lot of variables. Anytime you look at history over the past 70 plus years, uh, there's a lot of variables that you could want to control things change. Uh, you know, I found it sort of remarkable that there is any sort of consistent characteristic, but you know, we don't have a lot of data points. And so uh, it's hard to do much more analysis, but anecdotally, and all of this is somewhat anecdotal, uh, the points that you're making do matter. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question. So um, did you uh, test um, like how, um, like on some kind of train where you, um, where you see just, uh, let's say like events uh, before, um, I don't know, 2000 or 2010 and see how likely they are to impact another test set on another period and uh, how that actually works out in um, like uh, forward looking uh, scenarios. So are you saying, for example, if I did this analysis and only did it for the period from 2000 back, would the characteristic market behaviors that I observed for the four types still apply as I looked at things from 2000 on? Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, I didn't do that um, because, uh, you know, there wasn't really enough data, but I, I think the sort of thing you'd want to look at are these types of charts. Um, so here we have uh, 48, 56, 66, 81. And so, you know, you kind of look at it and they all tend to have the same behavior. So uh, if I'm drawing things from different decades and they have similar characteristics across those decades, then, you know, I feel like there's something robust there. Um, you know, Ray, Ray Dalio has a notion, which I sort of disagree with, but, you know, it's uh, his idea that the markets are, in his words, timeless and universal. That there's some characteristics that exist in the markets that you can go all the way back to whenever and they would still be that way. I don't subscribe to that uh, exactly, but there is, to some extent that is true. And, you know, people push back on this and said, how can that possibly be? Uh, you know, you had a very high commission, purely retail market that then turned into an institutional market that then had low commissions, that then had a Fed that did the, you know, that, that then had derivatives that then, you know, so it's interesting as you go from 1946 to now, you do see some of these characteristics being consistent. Okay, thank you. Oh, and by the way, this is, there's other, I just did these four. There's others uh, than these four, but you know, this is, uh, if you have more than four, you can't figure out what's going on in the chart. Rick, there's a question in the chat uh, from Arden Hall. For bank stress tests, this is something you've worked on, right? The Fed designs the scenarios that must be used. Do you think your approach would be helpful for constructing stress scenarios for banks? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I One of the scenarios we have is the Fed adverse scenario. And as you can see, this is the actual Fed stress case down here. 200 days to the bottom, 55% drop in equities and so on. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it turns out that what they're doing here is towards the bottom of the macro risk envelope. Uh, so they may have done an exercise similar to what I've done, in fact, I'd be surprised if they haven't, where they've looked at past bad, bad cases and sort of asked the question, how bad did it, how bad was it? What happened to rates and so on? You know, here they have treasuries 
dropping to 25 basis points. But you know, the federal funds rate dropped 150 basis points to somewhere between zero and 0.25 with the events in March. So my bet is that uh, they, maybe they don't do it as broadly because they don't care about non-economic shocks, but I think they probably use information based on historical cases. Thank you. Uh, so let me try again. Any any more questions on this uh, interesting and, and I would say courageous material? I mean, if someone asked me to explain all the crazy things that have happened and categorize them over the last hundred or so years, I, I would find that a pretty daunting task. Actually, uh, it is certainly uh, certainly uh, remarkable in how actionable these ideas are. Uh, I, I do like Saad's question, wonder if there's a way we can get some sense of out of sample testing into this area, but I, I don't really see how. Yeah, and, and that's where, you know, if you think about it, sort of the people sitting around the table trying to figure out what's going on, uh, the, you know, they can't, if they look at a past event, so here's a way to think of it maybe, if I'm sitting around a table uh, and in my mind, I think, well, gee, everybody's worried about inflation. And I remember back in the early seventies with whip inflation now buttons and all this stuff. So I would say, ah, there's an event I can latch onto. But then I say, oh, but wait a minute. That just was a total outlier. And that doesn't make sense. In a way, what, what you're saying there is that does not work as an out of sample event. Of course, you have the benefit of hindsight when you do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess the fact of the matter is this isn't out of sample, but so qualitative, which with such a small sample set that I'm, you know, as I said earlier, I'm not trying to do any sort of hypothesis testing. It's a little bit like here it is, you know. Take it, use it for what it's worth. Okay, last chance guys, before we uh, thank our speaker and, and uh, let him get back to his day job. This is Arden again, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, um, I, I'm just really interested in this methodology and I was wondering if you think that this is this the approach that you use would be sort of generally useful in a case where you know more quantitative you know more precise modeling wouldn't work. So let, let me give you an example. If I were a year ago uh, asked to do a prediction about returns on commercial real estate backed securities right at the beginning of COVID. I might have a model based on historic data, but I doubt I believe it. And I guess my question is, could you do something like what, do you think you could do something like what you did and apply it in a circumstance like that? Yeah, yes. That's, that's really what I'm doing here right now for the S&P in the course of S&P important events. Uh, you could pick, again, it could be a foreign market that you do it for Japanese equities, or you could be doing it for any market. And you could say, uh, rather than looking at a historical curve for the S&P and picking events and going from there, you could look at the historical curve for treasuries or high yield bonds or uh, Japanese equities, same thing. And then do the same exercise, get the events, try to identify them in a qualitative way based on what the history was and decide if, and then try to develop a response envelope based on that. And maybe as was the case here, find uh, types that help refine things even more. Um, the problem with a case like what you're mentioning is you do need to have enough history to get, you know, even if you're not dividing things by types, so I needed a, a reasonable amount of events because I was dividing it by four. 
Um, but even if you don't divide by types, probably you would want to have six, seven, eight events to give you information. Um, but you could then do the same thing. And, and even if it's just a matter of staring at the response curve for each event, you now have more information than you would have otherwise. Because as you pointed out, uh, the last one or two years is going to do nothing for you. All right. Yeah, great. Thank you. More questions? Any more questions? Okay, well, Rick, thank you very much for a completely fascinating talk. Uh, gives me a lot to think about. Uh, so everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us this semester. We're uh, done for now. We'll be back uh, late in August. And uh, I wanna wish everyone a very safe and healthy and fun summer. Uh, please look for us uh, um, when the next semester starts. So thank you very much, Rick. And uh, you, good uh, summer, everyone. Yeah, I'll do too. Okay, bye now. Bye -bye.